protests against financial power sweeps this world this week. Science may have confirmed the protesters' worst fears. An analysis of the relationship between 43,000 transnational corporations has identified a relatively small group of companies, mainly banks, with disproportionate power over the global economy. The study's assumptions have attracted some criticism, but complex systems analysis contacted by new scientists say it is a unique effort to untangle control in the global economy. Pushing the analysis further could help identify ways of making global capitalism more stable. The idea that a few bankers control a large chunk of the global economy might not seem like news to the New York's Occupy Wall Street and protesters elsewhere, but a study by a trio of complex system theorists at the Swiss Federal Institution of Technology in Zurich is the first to go beyond ideology to empirically identify such network of power. It combines the mathematics long used to model natural systems with comprehensive corporate data to map ownership among the world's transnational corporations, TNCs. Reality is so complex we must move away from the dogma, whether it's conspiracy theories or free markets, says James Gladderfielder. Our analysis is reality-based. Previous studies have found that a few TNCs own large chunks of the world's economy, but they included only a limited number of companies that admitted indirect ownerships, so could not say how this affected the global economy, whether it made more or less stable, for instance. The Zurich team can, from August 2007, a database listing 37 million companies and investments worldwide. They pulled out 43,060 TNCs and the share ownerships linking them. Then they constructed a model of which companies controlled others through shareholding networks, coupled with each company's operating revenues to map the structure of the economic power. The work was to be published revealing a core of 1,318 companies with interlocking ownership. Each 1,318 had ties to two or more other companies. On an average, they were connected to 20. What's more, although they represented 20% of the global operating revenues, the 1,318 appeared to collectively own, through their shares, the majority of the world's large blue-chip and manufacturing firms, the real economy, representing a further 60% of global revenues. And we do know that money is all fine and everything as long as it's spread out evenly and equally. Once the moment that people start to monopolize the money, you now have an economy controlled by those people, not for the people, by the people, but a monopolization of power over a few or the one empowering themselves over the many and controlling their economy, controlling their government, controlling all of our lives. When the team further untangled the web of ownership, it found much of it tracked back to the super entity of 147 even more tightly knit companies. All of their ownerships was held by other members of the super entity. That controlled 40% of the total wealth in the network. In effect, less than 1% of the companies were able to control 40% of the entire network of corporations, says Gladfelder. Most were financial institutions. The top 20 included Barclays Bank, J.P. Morgan Chase and Company, and the Goldman Sachs Group. John Driffle of the University of London, an macroeconomics expert, says the value of the analysis is not just to see if a small number of people controls the global economy, but rather to the insights into economic stability. Concentration of power is not good or bad in itself, says the Zurich team, but the core's tight interconnections could be. If one company suffers distress, this propagates it all. As we learned in 2008, such networks are unstable. If one company suffers distress, this propagates. It's disconcerting to see how connected things really are. 
I believe is George Singer Harry of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in La Jolla, California, a complex system expert who is in Vise Dutch Bank. Yenier Bahar Young, head of the New England Complex Systems Institute, warns that the analysis assumes ownership equates to control, which is not always true. Most company shares are held by fund managers who may or may not control what the companies they part own actually do. The impact of this on the system's behavior, he says, requires more analysis. Crucially, by identifying the architecture of global economic power, the analysis could help make it more stable. By finding the vulnerable aspects of the system, economics can suggest measures to prevent future collapses spreading through the entire economy, kind of like what's happening now. Lafelder says we may need global antitrust rules, which now exists only at a national level to limit overconnection among TNCs. Mariam says the analysis suggests one possible solution. Firms should be taxed for excess interconnectivity to discourage the risk. One thing won't chime with some of the protesters' claims. This super entity is unlikely to be the international result of a conspiracy to rule the world. Such structures are common in nature, says Sigurd. Newcomers to any network connect preferentially to highly connected members. TNCs buy shares in each other over the business reasons, not for the world domination. If connectedness clusters, so does wealth. In similar models, money flows towards the most highly connected members. The Zurich study is strong evidence that simply rules governing TNCs give rise spontaneously to highly connected groups. The Occupy Wall Street claim that the 1% of people have most of the wealth reflects the logical phase of self-organizing economy. So the super entity may not result from conspiracy. The real question, says the Zurich team, is whether it can exert concerted political party. I think these guys are naive. Okay, they have their, they put together the model, but they're just a little bit too blind to see the rest of the truth. But that's fine. We'll use their article. They did the science work. We appreciate it. We'll show and represent the, the points that they've stated out. But when you get down to this and you follow it, J.P. Morgan and these certain things are connected to it, come on! Fucking ridiculous! I'm pretty sure even Alex Jones would be like shaking his head at this shit. The film fills 147 is too many to sustain collusion. Ah, I suspect they will compete in the market but act together on common interests. So the super entity may not result from conspiracy is what they're trying to state because, you know, they have to pave the way because otherwise this media wouldn't even allow this information out. They have to say it's not, it's not a conspiracy. They have to state that to be able to get this information out. But truth be stated, read the rest of the line. They even contradict themselves in the next statement. The real question, says the other team, is whether it can exert concerted political power. Threadfield feels 147 companies interconnected, which they came to the conclusion of, is too many to sustain collusion. Rama suspects they will compete in the market, but act together in common interests. Hmm. No, that doesn't sound like um, one power trying to come together and enforce their own belief systems upon us. No, no, common interests coming together has nothing to do with one or the other. Resisting changes to the network structure may be one such common interest. How about we just stop allowing the power of money all in one hand? They don't, these people do not want to let go of their power, their money. They want to hold on to it and at the same time convince everybody that it's not me, it's somebody else. 